Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Shannon Miller. Before I bring on my guest, I need to share something important. For years, I struggled to feel confident around the type of people that I spend much of my time with, successful people, millionaires, CEOs, and leaders. Part of it was mindset, but also part of it is how I looked. Look good, feel good, as the saying goes. And I didn't look good. I didn't have clothes that made me feel confident. So I started buying expensive shirts, but then I had to get them tailor fit to me and athletic build. Then I discovered a new shirt. It's not only designed by athletes for athletes, it's designed to fit an athlete's body type. And it's made of athletic material. It's like putting on your favorite workout shirt, but it's a business shirt. It's machine washable and wrinkle free, which is a total deal breaker for me. I hate high maintenance clothing. And it looks better than the expensive shirts that I used to buy, and it even costs less. Now I feel confident that I'm wearing good looking, well fitted clothing that's designed to fit me. You can try one on yourself, totally risk-free because it's free shipping for you, one of my listeners. Just visit their website, stateandliberty.com, and use the discount code SUCCESS. That's stateandliberty, S-T-A-T-E, stateandliberty.com, and use the discount code SUCCESS. Returns and exchanges are totally free within 30 days, so there's absolutely zero risk for you to try one on. Again, go to stateandliberty.com and use the discount code SUCCESS. Shannon is the most decorated Olympic gymnast in American history with seven Olympic medals. She's the only female athlete to be inducted into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame twice. Individual in 2006 and as a team with the team in 2008, her tally of five medals at the 92 Olympics was the most medals won by a U.S. athlete in any sport. At the 96 Games, she led the magnificent, magnificent, magnificent seven to the U.S. women's first ever team gold. And for the first time for any American gymnast, she captured gold on the balance beam. After retiring from competition, she got degrees in marketing and entrepreneurship, followed by a law degree. She launched her own health and wellness company in 2010, and she travels the country as a highly sought-after motivational speaker and advocate for the health, uh, health and wellness of women and children. In January of 2011, Shannon was diagnosed with a rare form of ovarian cancer, and after surgery and aggressive treatment, she is now cancer-free. Shannon's book, It's Not About Perfect, Competing for My Country and Fighting for My Life, is her inspirational memoir written to encourage and empower others to break through and overcome their own personal challenges. And as usual for the listener, if you don't have time to listen to the entire episode, if you hear something you like, make sure you grab your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Shannon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So let's start from the beginning. How did you find gymnastics? How did you first get into gymnastics? I, you know, I, I like a lot of uh, young gymnasts, I kind of fell into the sport. I was basically tearing up my parents' furniture, <laughs> learning <laughs> to do flips on my own. And, um, and you know, my parents were worried about, well, their furniture, but also us getting injured, me and my older sister, Tessa. And uh, they decided it kind of looked like gymnastics, so maybe that's what they would have us do. And um, we just went to a gym down the road that was only a recreational program, had no team. Uh, my parents were not envisioning the Olympics. I had never watched the Olympics. I just wanted to flip upside down. And how and, old were um, you at that point? 
I was five. I was five. And, um, and I never looked back. I, I followed my sister into it because I just wanted to be her. And, um, she, a few months later went on to swimming and I had decided even at that age that this is, this is what I want to do. I'm not leaving the gym. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny you talk about flipping on the furniture and that's my daughter right now, my seven-year-old daughter. She's constantly flipping and, and doing everything on the furniture. I mean, she's, in, she's in gymnastics now, but, uh, it's, it's, I think she's, she's starting out at the, in the same place where I think a lot of young women and, uh, young men too start out with gymnastics. And I'm always fascinated by the level of training that goes into gymnastics. My niece is seven also, and she trains like, I think she has like three, three hour practices during the week and then a five hour, or maybe it's four hour practices and then a five hour practice on Saturdays. I mean, tell me a little bit about and tell us a little bit about what the training was like for you in your peak years, Shannon. I think you start gradual, um, you know, one hour a week and and then it kind of moves up from there. Um, By the time I was competing, I started competing at nine years old um, and I was probably training four hours a week, um, probably five, six days a week. And then by the time I was training for uh, my first Olympic Games, it was a good six or seven hours a day, six days a week. How old were you at your first Olympic Games? 15. 15. 15. Yeah. I was a baby, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you essentially broke the four minute mile for American women when you captured gold on the balance beam. I mean, there were others probably around the world who may have had, I don't know, comparable coaching, I imagine. Maybe others who trained as hard as you, probably not many, but I mean, there's there probably others who, who put a lot of hours in like you did. But what gave you the mindset to break that barrier? And I ask this because everybody listening to this has a barrier, whether they don't believe they can, I don't know, make more money or have a healthy relationship or get fit or whatever the case might be. Everybody has that limiting belief. But what what made you believe that you could actually do something that's never been done before? Well, I think it was a couple things. You know, I think, first of all, I... I, honestly, I believe ignorance is bliss <laughs> at times um, because I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. I didn't know that this wasn't supposed to compete at the Olympics. I didn't know 15 was really young. I mean, I didn't know these things until people would tell me about that. And my parents really kind of kept me sheltered from from any of a, a lot of the negative, negative thoughts. And, and they raised me to believe that if I worked hard, and I was willing to be dedicated to something, then the sky's the limit. And and you can be or do anything you want to, but you've got to be willing to work for it. And so that's what I focused on. There was less focus on what you can't do and more focus on what can I do today to get there. And I think that's often what we have to kind of change our focus and I think there's a lot of times where, you know, everyone will find reasons why you can't succeed. And and we're sometimes the worst at it ourselves. You know, we find all these reasons why we can't be our best or do our best or break through these barriers. But what we have to do and what we have to train ourselves to do is to always see the opportunity. Instead of looking at what we can't do, look at why we will succeed. And for the listener who hears that and says, like, right now they're saying, okay, I get it. I can, I can, you know, look at the positive opportunity. But how do we, how do we train ourselves to do that? I mean, you had, you know, uh, you had a coach, right? You had a coach, you had teammates mm-hmm. around you. And I'm a big advocate of that. I teach in my teachings about this and the environment of excellence, right? You had this environment where, you know, you had people feeding the positive mindset into you and other people holding you accountable. But like, how do you create that now? Like how does somebody create that environment where they can actually think positively? Cause they go out there every day and we fail and we struggle and we face obstacles and adversity. And then we're on Facebook and trying to like match what everybody else, the new car and the new home or the family or everything else that other people are doing. How do we, how do we create that mindset now though? I think you have to get away from a lot of that. I think you have to run your own race. And so we always talked about is you got to run, run your own race and whether it's a competition, whether it's your work, whether it's your family life, um, whatever that is, you've kind of got to train yourself to put the blinders on and forget about what everyone else is doing and run your own race. And so you have to figure out what are your specific goals and they're probably not going to be the same as your neighbors or your best friends or even your parents. You have to create your own goals and then work each day to figure out how you're going to chip away 
and 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 get closer to that goal and and forget about all of the things you see on social media and so it's a great tool but don't live by it right so when you talk about um you know having coaches and, and people around me that kind of um, ingrain that the positive mindset you you can't do that from the outside. You have to do that from within. You have to wake up each day and decide to be positive. You have to make that conscious decision to be proactive in each step that you take. And you have to be proactive and, and positive even when you fail. And I know we'll talk about that. But nef- it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be easy. But if you're constantly striving to do your very best. You are very best, not be the best, but do your best, then you're on the right track. And that doesn't mean you're going to be um, successful at everything. That's not going to happen, but you're going to be successful at a whole lot more than if you had a negative attitude or if you allowed others to kind of bring, bring you down or, or make you feel like you might not achieve something for whatever reason. Do you advocate setting goals, like written goals, documented goals? Absolutely. That is one of my biggest, um, biggest things. I shout that from the rooftops. Um, I think goals are incredibly important. I think it's true. If you don't have a goal, then you don't know where you're headed. Um, now, uh, you know, saying that it's, it's great to have a long-term goal. Um, my coach used to sit us down on the floor exercise at the beginning of every season and we had to write down and, and I mean, black and white ink on paper, we had to write down those long-term goals. So, you know, what did we want to accomplish that year? Well, I want to make it to the state meet. Um, Eventually I would write, you know, I want to represent the United States at the Olympic games. And then he made us turn that over because it's great to have a goal, but how are you going to get there? And I think that's a lot of times where we fall short is we have this great goal, but we don't really work every single day. We don't have a specific task each day in order to get us there. So what were the things I could come into the gym every single day and work on that would further me um, in getting that goal? You know, those were things like conditioning. It's not fun. It's not glamorous. But if I did the right push-ups and sit-ups and and all of those things, I would get stronger and I could do the bigger skill. So it all worked toward that goal. And I think oftentimes we can set those big goals. And we can even set those, those baby step goals along the way. And I look back at my career and I think, you know, what made the difference? You know, when I face challenges at work or if I miss the mark, I think back to my career and I think, what made the difference between me and and the girl sitting next to me? Because we both wrote down our goals. So what made the difference? And when I look at my career, I look at um, the importance of going that extra step. You know, we always talk about working hard, but if you ask most nine-year-olds, I mean, your, your daughter's almost there. Ask most nine-year-olds to do 10 sit-ups, and they'll do 10. Maybe they'll do a few less. But how many are going to do more? And it's the same with adults. How many yeah. of us get up and say, you know, we're going to do more than what was asked today? And I think that's often what makes a difference in succeeding toward your goal is, are you willing to take that extra step? Are you willing to do more? Even when you're successful, then you create the next goal, and you're always willing to go a little bit above and beyond everyone else. If you ask my my sons or my daughters uh, about, you know, if they're doing exercises or anything like that, if I say, if someone asks you to do 10 push-ups, how many do you do? They all, they all say 11. So they know that uh, they know that the, <laughs> to do, always to do more than what's asked of them. And it's fascinating to learn, Shannon. I think whenever we talk to anybody who's achieved anything significant, from the outside looking in, a lot, oftentimes it just looks easy and we don't realize the work that went into it. And when we, when we really find out, we go, wow, that, I didn't realize that that person was doing all of these things. They were actually, you know, working these hours or putting this, uh, this crazy mm-hmm. amount of practice and doing, be, you know, above and beyond what coach asked. And they're writing down their goals and, and following an action plan. And, and I think just a lot of people don't, don't realize that from the outside looking in, they don't realize the, the work and the effort in the, in the struggle that goes into achieving something significant. And when I was doing, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, I always say, and I, and I tell this to other athletes, I tell this to everyone, medals are not won on the day of competition. They're not. They're won with the hard work and the de- dedication that happens every single day for years before you even step on the floor. 
And that's what we have to remember is you, you have to be willing to put in the hard work, not necessarily knowing that you're going to get the gold. You have to um, put in the hard work each and every day. And sometimes for years on end, if you want to see that success, whether it's in business, whether it's in life and sport. And doing my research for this interview, Shannon, I watched one of your YouTube channel videos and you said, don't wish for success, expect it. That's a hard thing to do because we always think about wishing for success and hoping for success, but you're saying we should expect it. You have to expect it. You have to, and and success takes on a lot of different forms. And I think it probably means something a little bit different to each of us and probably different at at different stages in our life. Um, So I think you have to define success for yourself at that moment um, or that period of time. And then you have to go after it and you have to expect of yourself and believe in yourself to the point that you know, hey, this this is going to succeed. If I you talked about an action plan. If I work and I chip away at this action plan every single day and I, I re-up, I, I think about it again each day and I really put in the work, then absolutely this can happen. And, you know, of course, we have to have that conversation about um, getting derailed and, and sometimes on the pathway to that goal, it's not a straight line. Most of the time, it's pretty curvy and winded, and sometimes you fall off a cliff <laughs> and you have to find a way to get back up. So there's lots of things that happen along the way, but if you can kind of continue to see that big picture, and and then when you do fall off track or have challenges or barriers that are in your way, you can be more solutions-oriented in how you work through them. After retiring, a lot of athletes struggle to find and figure out what's next. I mean, shoot, a lot of listeners listening to this right now are probably wondering what's next for their lives. Did you struggle with that, Shannon? I did. I did. You know, uh, people see the height of my career and the gold medals, and then they see kind of um, what I'm doing now. But there's definitely a period in there. And so many athletes go through this professional athletes, Olympic athletes, um, especially when you retire early. I mean, I retired at the ripe old age of of 19. (laughs) So you, you haven't necessarily thought through what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Where do I go from here? And I think there's also that added and, and it's, you know, hard to feel real bad for yourself, but you, you do go from, you know, performing in front of thousands, if not millions of people on a regular basis to all of a sudden the next day it's gone and your team is gone, which has basically been your family for year after year after year. Um, Your structure is gone. You're no longer supposed to be somewhere 40 plus hours a week. Um, So there's a lot of things that change pretty much overnight. And if no one has helped you prepare for the future, it can be a very um, difficult, um, even depressing for many athletes place to be. And I think the one thing that helped me um, to keep it maybe a little bit less rocky was my education. Um, my education was always first and foremost in our house. Education came first, and that's great that you want to go to the Olympics, honey. We'll support you, but how'd you do on your math test? <laughs> and that's we. I understood that. If I didn't keep my grades up, I didn't get to go to the gym. That was a treat. And so education is kind of what kept me going um, through the, the kind of the difficult times after, after retiring from sport. I mean, are there any thoughts or, or suggestions for the listener in terms of, you know, a lot of folks are, are, are you know, they're in their thirties or forties or fifties and, and even sixties and they're in, they're trying to figure out what's next. You know, um, I talked to a guy yesterday who he's 54 years old and he's achieved all the success in the world that you're supposed to want to attain and family and kids and home and a uh, job and significant wealth. And, and he's trying to figure out like what's next. He doesn't have that structure. Like you mentioned, he's retired mm-hmm. and he doesn't have that structure in his life because you know, he doesn't have to wake up and be at a job every day anymore. Um, he's made his money and, and his kids are graduated from college and it's like, now what, you know, I mean, any, any thoughts on trying to figure out how to answer that question? What's next? I mean, anything that you did coming out of uh, retirement that helped you? 
one thing that helped me was when there, when I realized that I was kind of in this um, area where I didn't know what to do next. And I realized this was not a place I wanted to be. Um, when there wasn't structure, um, I think you have to create structure. You have to create it for yourself. And that means going out and finding what is that next goal? What is that next thing I want to do? And you can start small. Um, sometimes we get so frozen, so paralyzed because uh, we can't think of that big next step. Sometimes you just have to get started with something. So, you know, no matter what it is, you just have to start with something. And, and maybe that's, um, you know, a local charity. Start volunteering. Start doing something while you think through um, if there's something different that you want to be doing. But you have to get started with something. You cannot be uh, paralyzed into lack of movement, lack of motion, lack of ideas, um, lack of goals. You've got to find, even if it's not the perfect goal or what you think needs to be the perfect goal, you just need to set a goal and go for it. And tell us about your cancer diagnosis. That must have rocked you. I mean, it must have hit you like a bombshell, especially considering that you're out speaking and, and advocating for the health and wellness of women and children. Well, I think, um, so my mother's a cancer survivor. So, um, I, you know, I, I kind of, um, been through it a little bit with her and I think what I, you know, it, it, cancer diagnosis is always shocking. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, but I think the other part of that is it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, cancer doesn't care that I have gold medals. So I, it was kind of a, why not me? Um, and, and then how can I, use this to help others. Um, one of the things that struck me the most is being uh, involved with women's health and wellness to the degree that I already had been. I didn't know the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer. And so when I had three of, of the primary four symptoms, I went in and told my doctor I felt fine. And so how can I use that experience, use that challenge to help others not make my same mistake. Is that a mindset? You mentioned, you know, how can I use this to help others? Is that something that you thought of? I mean, did you consider that during, you know, when you were battling cancer? Or is that something that hit you afterwards? Um, you certainly had really, a platform, you know, mm -hmm. before, you know, while you were fighting this. Uh, it's really something that um, I made the decision on during um uh, after surgery, when um, that's when I found out that it was um, actually cancer and I uh, was preparing for chemotherapy. And um, that's really when I decided that this was um, it, it not just something that I, I should do um, because it is a platform that um, that is available to me and, and could help. But to be honest, it was also something cathartic for me. I am not very good at looking backward. I am constantly in forward motion <laughs> um, and, and that may not always be the best thing, but I'm constantly in forward motion. And what I learned through sport is that you can cry about the failures. You can cry about mistakes. You can cry about challenges all day long, but the most important thing is let's get up, dust yourself off and keep moving forward, especially in the heat of competition. And so I'm just kind of, my brain is trained that way. And I think that I was wired that way even before gymnastics. Um, to just continue thinking and moving forward. And so I feel like if there's something positive that can come out of any situation, no matter how dire it seems, if there's something positive that can come out of it, then let's, let's go with that. Let's really focus our energy and channel our energy in that way. Looking back on your career as one of the best gymnasts that the world has ever seen, as somebody who's battled and won over cancer, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a speaker, what habits do you have, Shannon, that you feel have set you apart, things that have helped you achieve success at a level that, that most really can only dream of? Um, any habits that you have that, um, that have been part of your success? <laughs> I'm really stubborn. <laughs> um, you know, I, and I say that, and it's something that we joke about um, because because we see it in my daughter as well. She's four, right. and and she's kind of a mini Shannon. But 
it's true. You know, you have to have a little bit of stubbornness um, and not in a negative way, but in a way that, hey, nobody's going to tell me I can't do something. And you know what? If you tell me I can't do something, then guess what? I am even more challenged. I see that as a challenge. I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong about it. I'm just going to go work as hard as I can and I'm going to prove you by my actions that you're wrong. Um, I'm too small. I'm, um, you know, not from the right gym. I'm not, um, you know, wh- whatever it is that people would say during my career, I would always think to myself, all right, I'll, I'll change your thinking. And I would go to the gym and work even harder. So you think you have to have a little bit of that stubborn streak that when you hear no, um, that's just the beginning of the conversation. I mean, this is, this helps you in sales and this helps you every day in, in your family and in your work. I mean, people tell us no all the time and we just feel like, all right, that's the beginning of a conversation. Let me share with you why (laughs) it will work. So I think that's one thing, Um, you know, you've heard lots of things like, you know, reading a lot. Um, I'm the ultimate bookworm. So, you know, I think reading and educating yourself on um, so many different topics, because you can learn something every day, all throughout the day. And you can learn so much by listening to people, by reading um, things that are applicable to every aspect of your life. So I'm, I'm kind of that, that person that I want to constantly learn and just soak up. Um, I think being active is important. I mean, we know the physical part of being active. It helps your brain work better. You're less stressed. You manage your time, um, you know, all of those things. But I think being active also helps you remain active. And that's in mind, body, and spirit. I think making sure that you're up and moving. Um, I mean, for me, I do conference calls while I'm walking. I've been walking around while I do this, which <laughs> maybe mm-hmm. isn't the best thing, but um, I'm, I'm constantly in motion and it helps, it helps me keep my brain moving. Um, but it also, I, I don't get sedentary in my body and in my thinking. And I think that's important. You have to constantly be in that active state. It's interesting that you're walking around. I, I definitely enjoy walking around when I'm on the phone as well. And I, the uh, podcast guest I just had on recently, Mark Podolsky, uh, very successful investor in, in, in his own right. And he, uh, he was actually on a treadmill desk during our <laughs> call, you know, so same thing, you know, always walking, always moving. I have a standing desk in my office and, and, uh, like to be, to be moving as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's great advice. Shannon, you've experienced tremendous success in your life. I mean, the, the, the Olympic record is obvious, but also now in business, you've experienced uh, incredible success. And from the outside, again, from the outside looking in, it, we see somebody like yourself who, and, and we think it's easy to think that, that Shannon just doesn't know failure, that she doesn't, she doesn't experience, experience the failure, the setback, the adversity, the obstacles that I have in my life. Can you, Share a time when you're where you actually have failed, and and maybe as a result you felt that hopelessness or that overwhelming self doubt that comes with failure. Uh, but you're able to overcome it and work through it and achieve despite or even because of that. Well, I think you know so much of um, so many of my stories revolve around sport because that's what I've spent so much of my life doing. Um, but I think sport really does connect to our everyday lives. Um, we all understand things through sport. Um, certainly I've had plenty of failure in my regular life, but I think, you know, as a parent, you, you have failure every day in, in different ways. But, um, I think when I, um, am at this point in my life, I look back to those things that I utilized during my training and the failures I had, because at that point in my life, it was a big deal. You know, you kind of did feel like all was lost when you fell off the beam. And, and so it's the same feeling and, and it may not have truly been the end of the world, but it felt like it at that moment. And so you can sure. kind of apply that to other areas of your life. But, um, there's one competition that, that anyone that's uh, followed my career can probably identify with, but um, like I said, I've had lots of failures, but this was um, a pretty public one. I was at world championships in 1993 and um, I had come off the 1992 Olympics. I had 
injured my elbow, broken my elbow about 10 weeks before Olympic trial. So I wasn't even supposed to make that team, but I made it onto the team. I came home with five Olympic medals. It was kind of insane. The next year I go to world championships um, in 93. I won the all around things are going amazing. I make it to the balance beam finals, the event finals. This is my event. I am the beam girl. And I went up and I fell right off the bat. And I knew all was lost at that moment, but all right, you get back up and you keep going. You try to salvage what you can. A few skills later, I fall off the beam again on a skill that, you know, I should be able to do in my sleep. And I have competed for probably 12 years at that point. So, or well, I may not competed 12 years at that point, but, um, but like seven. And then I'm so embarrassed. You know, you just kind of want to get off the beam and crawl under a table and, and all eyes are on you. The whole world's watching. And I go up for my dismount and I fall a third time, which in gymnastics, that's unheard of. At that level, you don't fall, much less falling three times in one routine. So it was beyond embarrassing. I knew my coach was not going to be happy. Um, it was just one of those moments in time where you, know, you, you are very humbled. You, you, you're supposed to be a world champion. You're supposed to be great at this event. And yet everything just fell apart. And, and as I said, it, it's not the end of the world. It's not even that big of a blip in my life anymore. But at the moment, at that time, it was. And it felt like that. And I had to figure out how I was going to move on. And I, within 15 minutes, I was supposed to march out for the next event, for floor exercise event finals. And it was one of those moments where you think, how do I even go and face people? How do I, I'm wearing red, white, and blue representing my country on the world stage. And I just completely blew it. How do I go back out? And what if it happens again? And all of the negative thoughts go into your mind. And, and I had to figure out a way to focus on the positive and, and march back out there and um, ended up marching back out there, ended up winning floor exercise, winning the gold on floor. And it's those, it's that moment that I go back to whenever I'm embarrassed, whenever I make a big mistake or have a, a huge failure or even just a minor failure in life. I think, you know, I've had these moments before and I lived and I got through it and it wasn't fun, but you've just got to focus on moving forward. And so, um, you know, I think we all have those moments in our life. Um, and, and sometimes they're really big failures. I mean, when you talk about real life scenarios where, um, people are losing, you know, their business and, um, the repercussions of that with taking care of your family and, and real, real life issues. I think in those moments, that's the most important time to be able to figure out a positive way to move forward all right, this is really bad, but what is my next step? How am I going to pick myself up and keep moving forward? That's one of the great lessons that I think that we learn through sports is that failure and struggle and adversity, adversity and setbacks are, they're going to happen, period. And, and for the listener, I want you to understand we are talking to one of the elite of the elite, one of the best gymnasts that the world has ever seen. And she experienced this failure in front of, like you said, in front of so many people, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions watching on TV around the world. And, and you, you experience this failure that is, that is so rare at, at, for anybody at that level, level, let alone yourself. And, and so I want you, I want the listener to understand that, that that's normal. It's, it's, it's part of life. Those things happen. So whatever failure you have that has, is limiting your self belief and limiting your your beliefs in in your ability to achieve amazing things. You need to put those into perspective and, and realize that success uh, can happen not only despite those, but oftentimes because of those. Because we can learn from that. So thank you for sharing that, Shannon. I know that's a that's a, that was a, probably a a very challenging time, like you said, in your life. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, and I think, you know, for me, I, you know, we talked about reading a lot. We talked about listening to other people's stories. And I think oftentimes what you, 
what you see and hear are those, you know, when you go through a really big failure, you know, there are many times where that failure becomes the best thing that ever happened to you. Um, you know, it, it made you rethink your job path. It made you rethink uh, what you're doing. It made you work your brain in a different way or invent something or become your own boss, start a company. You know, there's, I, you hate to say, oh, there's a reason for everything. I think that's, eh, I, I don't, I'm not in love with that saying, but I think you get to be in charge of your own destiny. And so when you are handed failure, when that happens, you get to decide what you're going to do with it. Yeah, you get to be in charge of your own destiny. Amen. It's just just well said, and and it's something that I think uh, everybody should should resonate with and and take at least that piece of advice out of this. Uh, so much so much great advice in this podcast. And by the way, uh, again for the listener, we're gonna have so much so many good things that have been talked about right here. Um, Jim Harshaw Junior. dot com slash action to get your copy of the action plan, Shannon. You're extremely busy. You're a mother. You're an entrepreneur. You're a speaker. Do you have any tools or tips or tactics that help you be more effective? Uh, the listeners like to get concrete things out of this, uh, these podcasts. Maybe it's a technology. Maybe it's a productivity tip. Maybe it's a supplement. I don't know. Anything like that that, that you could share with us that helps you be more effective in what you do? Um, I think there's a lot of things that help you be effective. Um, certainly, like I said, you, you've got the different buckets, mind, body, spirit. So, you know, for me, faith is first and foremost, and, and that's how I have to start and end each day and, and carry it through the day. Um, but I think when you're, when you're looking at you know, concrete things you can do each day, I think you have to have a mission, a mission statement. And, and it doesn't matter if it's for work or for your family, or really you should have one for both. Um, have it for the different kind of buckets and, and spaces in your life, because you have to be able to wake up each day and say, what, what is my purpose today? What is my, what is the, that thing that I needed, I need to fulfill? And so you have to have a mission and then you also have to have your goals. And, and I look at goals as, yes, you have those big goals and, and you can have those in the different buckets as well, but you've got to have those goals for every single day you get up. And there is no goal that is too small because it's the small ones that add up to making that dream come true. And part of that is list making. And I'm kind of a crazy list maker. I, I have my list for everything. And I literally, I, I try to be efficient by creating those lists. And then I make sure that my time, that it's easy to have a list that goes on forever. And these are all the things I need to do. But if you don't put a time frame on it, it doesn't really matter because it's not going to get done. Um, so my days are broken, about, broken out literally by the minute. And I, I had a friend the other day who I work with. She said, how do you break things out by the minute? It, because if you get off on one thing, then your whole day is shot. And I said, no, no, no. You have to add in time, you know, buffer time. You have to add in time for yourself. You make sure that you have workout time in there. Um, you make sure that you've got that extra five minutes in the morning when your your kids want to stop and look at the bug on the way out to the car. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you you have to build in. You can't be so strict with your time that you do um, get off really easy. But you have to be structured in your time where things will not get done. And so for me, list making and holding myself accountable to those lists and to that time frame is really important. What do you use for your calendar or, or list? Do you just use paper and pencil or do you use uh, like Outlook or Google Calendar or Asana or anything like that, like that in particular? I use well, I use Google Calendar to keep everything straight because, as you know, with four kids, um, you know, even with two, I've got to keep all their calendars. I've got to keep my husband's yeah. calendar, my work calendar, my personal calendar. So you can have it all in one. So I use that um, so that it's a little bit easier. But I also keep my daily list. I just keep on my phone, and so that and my phone is pretty much an extension of my body. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I, if I'm with the kids, I want it at the ready so I can take pictures of them because that's what moms do. Sure. And um, I want to make sure I'm checking back with it throughout the day to make sure I'm on task and I'm not missing anything. And it also helps me clump things together so that I can be more efficient with my time. Um, so, you know, I, I, 
I really go through each day um, before I go to bed. I look through my schedule for the next day and I make sure I'm being the most efficient with my time because I want plenty of time to have with my family. I don't want to work 24 seven. I want to work hard when I'm working, but I, I think there needs to be that balance in life as well. Shannon, first of all, I feel like there should be like a, 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 a prefix to your name. It should be like, I don't know, like like you're a knight or like sir or queen or or something <laughs> or doctor or something because you're just such an, an an amazing person, inspirational. You've had such incredible experiences in your life, and I appreciate you making time to share some of those on the show here with us today. Can you take a minute and just promote yourself? Tell us how the listener can find you, follow you, learn more about Shannon Miller lifestyle, etc. Sure, absolutely. So my company, uh, you can find it at shannonmiller.com. That's an easy one. And uh, certainly you can follow me on social media on Twitter and Instagram at shannonmiller96 and on Facebook and Pinterest at shannonmillerofficial. And um, we've got lots of fun stuff you can look at that are health related as well as gymnastics related. So it's a lot of fun. And for the listener, I will have links to everything she just mentioned in the action plan. Go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Shannon, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. <laughs> 